You're listening to Dirty Feet, a podcast from No More Radio. Vous écoutez le podcast Dirty Feet sur les ondes de No More Radio. Hosted by, animé par Alison Burns, J.D. Papillon, et Joanny Farah. Stay tuned. We're going to move you. Hello, everyone. You're listening to Dirty Feet once more. This week is our 47th episode, and we are having a sort of international artist, I guess we could say, a gentleman from Vienna, Austria. Chris Herring is here with us for his show, Running Sushi, which is being performed at Usense. So, hello, Chris, how are you doing? Hello, I'm fine, thanks. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, so, Chris, can you tell us about the uh, Canadian uh, run that you're having with uh, Running Sushi, which is starting uh, tonight at Usense in Montreal? Yeah, we are very pleased it's a uh, we have a canada tour with this show it started in halifax uh, and continues in calgary and uh, vancouver yeah the show starts tonight with <laughs> it's called running sushi <laughs> and it's not your first time in montreal you've been here before but with the company this would be your first canadian tour and first time in montreal yeah? this is right yeah for me personally it's not the first time i already was here as a performer it is i don't know in 97 in tangente But with using seed and uh, with liquid loft, it's the first time that we're here. Yeah. Very nice. And just to start off, can you tell us a bit about your uh, your background? How did you how did you start dancing? I guess how did your career come about? Actually, I came from music. I studied music and movement education in Vienna. I'm a, a piano teacher officially. But uh, at the age of like 17, 18, we as I found out that this is not really what I want to do, and. It, pulled me more into the dance direction and there, especially in the choreography direction and uh, tried to, to, to bring all my studies together and uh, studied dance then in New York, came back to Vienna, continued it and that's how it, how it just came up. And you have a Canadian in your team, Stephanie Cumming, right? Yes. How Stephanie. did you meet? How did this happen? Uh, she came to Europe already more than 10 years ago and uh, just passed by at the audition and we were so impressed by her that uh, we just immediately took her and she's great she's our kind of prima ballerina she's working with us since 10 years already yeah she's you have to check her out she's a really great performer she's originally from calgary where does the name liquid loft come from <laughs> as a company name <laughs> At this time, we need, uh, because we were, as a four people, we were always working together, a dramaturg, uh, Thomas Jelinek, the electronic musician Andreas Berger, and Stephanie Cumming as the main dancer. And uh, me personally, I was searching for a, a loft or a rehearsal space at this time and a flat as well. So we thought like it could be nice to have kind of a liquid loft, which transforms all the time. And concerning the uh, movement techniques, we found like that liquidity is something that uh, can be very interesting in terms of uh, science fiction inputs to our dance techniques, kind of morphing and liquidity. All these kind of things were in 2004 very actual, and that's why we decided to Uh, call it liquid loft. Are you talking about uh, multimedia or are you talking about the, the physical style of moving? Both, I would say, because um, most of the time we try to involve multimedia or like, let's say, new medias, lots of video. We always try to put contemporary dance in context to other art forms such as electronic music or we work always with uh, lots of visual artists and so this kind of mixture and liquidity is something that we also put into the name. And how long have you been working together? What number show is this for the company Liquid Loft? Oh, this I can't tell you, but the, uh, the company secret, exists. It's been a long time. The company exists since uh, 2004 okay. or 2005. It was actually officially, and uh, I mean the show running sushi, the one that we present here, was performed I think in like 40 countries, a couple of times always. So. Wow, okay. And let's talk about the premiere of the show, because this interests me quite a bit, that the Impulse Dance Festival in Vienna is where you had your, your world premiere for running sushi. How did that come about, and how did it go? Well, it's a long time ago. I think it went very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a huge festival, you know, mm -hmm. so you have like... A I, I don't know, There you have like more than 100 companies presenting their work there, but it's a great supporter of our work. So... It was very good at this time because we have lots of audience there. People know the company and it was good. 
And can you tell us, of course, about Running Sushi, the actual, the main event? Um, the way it's described um, on Yuzin Sei, on the, the description of the show, seems to be a very in interactive kind of show, uh, you know, multi-performance. Can you, can you explain it to us a bit? Uh, the uh, interactivity actually just happens in the beginning of the, of the piece because the, the whole show is very much inspired by Japanese manga. And so what we and and also the name running sushi like comes of course from this culture. And at this time when we created it, uh, there were like a lots of running sushi restaurants opening. It's this kind of restaurants where the sushi comes on a belt and you just pick up your bits and pieces. And I found this quite interesting because you had suddenly you had all these running sushi restaurants there. So we just named it running sushi. In the show, it happens like this: that the story is divided into 12 scenes, and every scene has a name. And in the beginning of the show, they serve sushi to the audience, and the order, uh, so each sushi piece is connected to one of those cards where the name of the scene is written on it. And uh, the order how the audience picks up the, the sushi pieces is also the order how they gonna present the show at night. So what you have a little bit. Uh, at the end is this kind of pulp fiction effect where you don't know what is in the beginning, what is at the end. And the reason why we do it like this is because we wanted to have the people looking closer to the movement and to the single scenes and not just on the complete story, and which works anyway much more associative than uh, chronological. So as a dancer, are you always uh, challenged to not... You know, you don't know what's going to come up next. I mean, you know, but the order is always changing. So how do you how do you deal with that? Even after many many years of performing it, I think you have to look at it more like, uh, let's say, like uh, paintings or drawings in an exhibition. So it's single scenes or single installation in a museum, and that's how they perform it. They perform actually twelve single pieces. So for them, it's uh, it doesn't matter what comes after what. Of course, sometimes it's more exhausting because if you have like the the loud scenes or the, the more uh, difficult scenes. Back but, to back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, I think for them it doesn't matter, and it's always different. That that makes it challenging. Yeah. And how is uh, multimedia integrated into this production? Uh, in this production. I would say in general, Liquid Loft works a lot with uh, with new media. But in this production, we said like we we keep it out, and because the body is already so much involved nowadays into uh, into new media, like if you think about all our communication systems like Facebook, Skype, uh, Twitter, whatever, that we said like this kind of artificiality we just use and integrate it in the body already, and the performers there is no projection or something on them but what they do is, what we do is we record the voices and their ideas and their body sounds and manipulate it in the computer and give it back to them so basically they are dubbing themselves they synchronize themselves and that makes the performance a little bit of looking strange although the people are just standing in front of you but you have the feeling something is not right or a little bit more artificial so I would say that's the multimedia in this piece Oh, cool. Also, if we could back up and talk about the inspiration again, what is the Zen philosophy of a manga household? Mm, that's a good question. I think if you ask it directly like this, I can just tell you that we performed it in Japan as well, and they asked the same question. We couldn't tell them. Mm -hmm. And I just can say that uh, the whole performance is more like looking at this uh, Japanese culture, which like uh, was indicated or integrated a lot in our life like feng shui or shiatsu or whatever, that it's more a look at this culture from the european side so it's not making fun about japanese culture it's more making fun about ourselves, how we receive this form of uh, like manga for example and and feng shui and uh, so this this words that you just said is like more a conglomeration of uh how we how we are using it and how we how less we know about that is it like um, an interpretation of the c surface understanding of modern japanese culture as opposed to like the the historical meaning of their culture or? yeah you could say it like this maybe i mean this this certain quote is is depending on one uh, scene that okay. happens there and it's like a manga painting you have to see it if i explain it it's a bit too <laughs> difficult <laughs> if you could explain it then why would you make a dance about it right, right. <laughs> Did you get feedback from the audience in Japan when you performed it there in, in about this theme that you're using? 
feedback. I mean, the Japanese people are quite nice, I can say, and they like liked it a lot. Uh, the say the negative feedback was more that we are playing around with uh, chopstick on stage, which is uh, kind of a uh, not a normal thing. It's actually not even it's not good because you shouldn't like you shouldn't play with food. And there is also some in two since there's some nudity that was also a problem. That that was the main topic in the in the question and answer afterwards. So. Of course, they were asking also like about the how these kind of things and manga is received in, in Japan and how we deal uh, in, in 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 Middle Europe and how we deal with that. In manga specifically, you're referring to kind of Japanese comics. Is that correct? Yeah, this is true. Can you describe a little bit the the style of manga comics? I mean, it's a very simple and clear language that's there. It's reduced to the maximum, and if you compare it to other comics, this is a very superficial describing now, yeah, because it's uh, related more to a very old culture also there. Yeah. And uh, it's just, I, I, I love to watch uh, or to read mangas because it, it has like this specific kind of drawings there and we just use this for the choreography as well. It's a very simple, clear body language also. Mm -hmm. that, uh, well, that's kind of what I wanted to get to because there there is a an easy physical relationship you can make between manga and dance, and and I right. so how do you take that and turn it into uh, moving moving material for real bodies? Uh, we relate there very much to uh, the super. It's called super flat theory from uh, Takashi Murakami, and the idea there is that. Uh, Nowadays, through the computer, we are so much uh, living in different dimensions, in like five, six, seven different dimensions on the computer, that you have to bring it back to one flat screen, on the flat screen. And if you think about comics, for example, when you have a, a figure standing there who is thinking something or saying something, you always have the bubbles next to it. So all the things that happen are brought to one uh, surface. And that's what we try to uh, do in dance as well. So concerning choreography, this is, of course, very interesting because everything that you have normally is split up in space or how, do, how you do choreography related to space is all brought on one kind of surface and it plays a bit with the superficiality and tries to dig in there and get out like the emotions of, of this kind of simple and clear but also clear body language. I would really love to pick your brains or hear you um, talk about contemporary dance. Um, you've trained in New York and you're from Vienna and here in Montreal. I was wondering how how did you enjoy your training in contemporary dance in the different cities? Because just Montreal and New York is very, very different, different for contemporary dance, for training, for performance that you see, for choreographers. I'd like to hear you talk about contemporary dance in these different uh, areas. Uh, this is a very complicated question after mm -hmm. the years, I would <laughs> say. But, um, I mean, you must understand this was like 25 years ago, so I'm sure it's now completely different. But in general, you can say that, uh, like in... in what you find in, in Middle Europe, not just in Austria, is that people come up with a lot of different style. And what was the biggest difference there is that people were always, like, at this time, relating to a certain kind of technique, for example. Like, you had this Cunningham technique, the Martha Graham technique, and, and, and. And uh, this you haven't had so much in, in Europe. There was more uh, tanz theater or physical theater, also new dance, of course. Uh, so I would say the dance community after a while through globalization became kind of uh, like the contemporary art scene. So you have uh, everything is like very much related to individuals or to personalities and less to techniques. So it depends on what the people are doing. You have like, you, you find like a kind of fusion kitchen at the moment there and I'm not sure if it's very different like this in Montreal. We have many companies from, uh, from Canada performing also in uh, at the Impulse Dance Festival, so it depends on what the people are doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of American artists from New York that come and set base in Montreal to perform. Uh, they seem to have slight more freedom, maybe, to um, maybe not embrace the technique as much as some Americans would like, or the modern dance influence. They like to venture away from that and use more... Uh, interdisciplinary performance, I guess, sort of like what you're doing. So I was thinking it's definitely a European influence, I find, that is, is coming to this side after all the techniques that are based here that we that were kind of always taught and were never not taught it. 
it's always part of our training. I think uh, Montreal was always like true because of those uh, strong companies that are based here as well was always like a kind of melting pot as well and um, it's a good idea that maybe you say that uh, European, Canadian, American dance mixes here or mingles here I don't know so far yet but what I see is that it's quite uh, open and very um, it has married a, a lots of different colors and I always heard about Montreal or it's always like in our mind also there is a, a strong exchange also and I think it's a, a good melting pot, as maybe New York was or still is. Yeah. Do you know a bit about the space you'll be performing in Montreal, Usine C, which always has different shows than, I guess, Agora de la Danse would have or um, Tangente will present? It's always something often international, I think, and often interdisciplinary. It has the, the space that can, that can do that, can, that can provide those kind of, uh, the kind of resources that companies need when they want to perform interdisciplinary work. Uh, do you know a little bit about uh, Uzinsi's work, where they present? Well, I know where it comes from. I know about Kaponga uh, Dos, and uh, I saw also the company at this time, at, as a, I think 2000, I was here, I saw them performing there, and it's a wonderful space. I mean, it's uh, ex exactly the right size that we need for dance performances is built for this also and uh, yeah it's internationally well known also so if people talk about Montreal they talk about using C yeah. doesn't mean that for example I, I performed in Dachon so I knew also Dachon or La Guarda Dance uh, so I show there so I think it's great to have these places also yeah well, we're talking about touring and, and experiencing different cities. I'd like to know, uh, kind of back to my Japanese question, the, the reception that you've had in different places. Um, my brief experience with Europe has taught me that people there are hungry for art. And uh, that's something that I, I miss at home sometimes. And I'm wondering, with you know touring for so long with this show, uh, if, if there are standout places with different reactions, unexpected reactions uh, that you've received this show is a bit strange I have to say because uh, it deals with a lot of uh, humor on one side but also sarcasm on the other side and people always interpret it a little bit different but what I can say uh, now experiencing it in different countries is that from east to west or north or south it's it's kind of people can deal with it or they can understand it so I would say it is basically because of this uh, clear language which kids understand as well as intellectuals so this with specifically I think because of, of the simplicity or clearness the um, you can play it also in different countries and for example this language barrier is, is just gone so I, I had good experiences with this show, I have to say. Yeah. So of course, dance is the universal language that everybody can understand in all the countries that you visit. Uh, you were discussing, though, using sound and language and playing with that timing. What language do you use? Uh, when we do the castings, we always try to look at uh, people with a, not just a different background, but also from different uh, nations or nationalities. And the reason why is because uh, each language has a, or each native language has a completely different rhythm. And so if you follow these kind of parameters and you record those people, then uh, it comes up, how shall I say, to, to compare it, to, for example, a person from Sweden to somebody who comes from South Africa has a completely different dynamic articulation, uh, volume, uh, tempo, rhythm. And with these kind of things we are playing because we record the dancers always from the very beginning on with their sounds and we ask them stories they, they give us their own personal stories and this is what we mostly involve also in the performance and of course through this uh, because you asked before through for new media with these techniques on the computer you can easily and very fast manipulate it so it can make your voice higher or your sound your body sound a little bit more hard or uh, more soft and uh, most of the performances are dealing with this kind of artificiality. So your your sound coordinator Andreas Becker is coordinating this live while it's happening on he's, stage. He's he's doing it live on stage, yes. But of, of course, he has lots of pre-recordings already from the people, and uh, yeah, he's the guy who is like since years every day with us in rehearsal space. So he's like the third dancer on stage. How does Liquid Loft work with visual artists? 
well for not just for every piece but maybe for every we often do series where which exists sometimes out of uh, as it it's uh, it's an installation to the same topic uh, or we do a movie for example we work together with a film director Mara Matushka who does something for uh, with, with the pieces of Liquid Loft or its performances and all the series work together always with one main visual artist and we ask this artist not just to do a stage set for us but also to go with us into space and to work with the dancers for example directly yeah. How does a visual artist work with the dancers directly? Uh, sometimes it just comes up with ideas for a choreography, for example, or uh, for some uh, movement stuff. And we had, for example, for two pieces, we had this artist Erwin Wurm, who is quite big in Europe, and he does this. Uh, he became well known for his one minute sculptures so he positions people all over in different places in a completely as out of context or in context in different places and uh, he worked with the dancers like um, he just asked them to position or gave like uh, uh, certain questions or instructions as one example that's an interesting way to work was that uh, whose whose instinct was that to start employing visual artists to work as in, in some sort of context if it's a choreographer I mean I understand how they're still working as a visual artist but with bodies but that kind of goes into that territory does it not? I'm not sure if it's a new idea <laughs> because if you look at uh, the productions of visual artists they are very much uh, installative or performative nowadays and I would say everything that came out of the like for example we always worked in a, in this black box theater versions and we ten have the tendency to go a lot into the white cube and from I, I just recognize that from visual artists it's exactly the opposite they are they are heading towards the the black theater and uh, leave the white cube for example where they do the installation so it's a, a, a mingling thing and it's not just if you talk about multimedia I think it doesn't have any it, it's a very common word already, yeah. so it depends on how the how people specific work to a certain topic. And did you have any manga artists work on running sushi by any it's, chance? He's not really a manga artist, but he's very much interested in it already. Uh, also, and uh, his name is uh, Bernd. He's a Viennese uh, comic drawer, and he tried to, for every scene, he also tried to make pictures, which we are using also on stage. Yeah. So from 2D to 3D to 2D again? Yes, as you could say, uh, to, to 1D. To 1D, okay. <laughs> and where's the four dimensions? <laughs> the four dimensions, maybe in our brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the interpretation of the work. Running the show for about seven years now, did you ever feel the urge to just create something new, completely different, do something on the side? Do you get tired of it? You know, you're a choreographer. Do you find that sometimes you, you have an impulse to, like, start a new concept or go somewhere else after all these years? Yeah, I understand this problem, and normally, often it is like this. I mean, we don't do shows for so long, like sometimes theater pieces, or, I don't know, musicals you run for ages. Uh, so this one is really like longer than normally, and uh, I. But I still have the feeling it's still actual because of this possibility that you always let chance rule somehow. And the, for example, the whole light concept, the whole sound concept, plus the two performers on stage, they always have to play together. And because it's uh, always in different constellations, so I don't really get bored of it. So it's never ending. Yes, and I still. I have to say, even seeing it now, I still, as a, at least in my opinion and with my feelings, it's still actual. And of course, the necessary question is, how has it changed since its premiere to now? <sighs> it changed. It changed already uh, during the premiere because of the fact that everything changes all the time. So I think, of course, like if you do it for a while, the the dancers plus also the musician and the light guy, they get much more comfortable with the things and what I can say nowadays is that you know, sometimes you have like really good orders which fit and which uh, would be exactly how you would do it 
and this was always the best when we had it in the beginning if you get like one if the audience choose like one of those orders it was a pleasure to watch it and if it didn't fit so well we were a bit like annoyed and said like okay tonight was not a good show but now it's like this that we are searching for this like really complicated things uh, to have a challenge by ourselves as well and this is interesting to see it's interesting that it changes since like the first show since it was since it's such a uh, not not random but well it kind of is random it changes right away I find that very interesting. Yeah, it changed the making. There's no, there's, it's, it's the combinations of how things can happen. It's yeah. exponential almost. Yeah, this is true. I mm. mean, of course, then uh, uh, if you if you're comfortable with something, you're looking for more challenging things, and these challenging things are more like the complicated things, which in the beginning you try to avoid. Hmm? Seven years is a long time running. I've discussed um, performing the same production multiple times with a friend, and he gives himself a new script every night. Uh, well, today it's my character's birthday, or today my cat died, or something to, to create just a personal background for him to know, to keep it alive for himself. And I'm wondering for, for you, for the performers, is there, is there tricks that you use to keep, to keep it fresh every time? I think when the performers go on stage, they have a, a big backpack with them with lots of different possibilities in there and it depends always what is the problem at the moment on stage which with what am I confrontated and then they just take out different possibilities that they, that they have out of their mental backpack and for me to see this as a choreographer because at this moment when they are facing this problem I cannot help them anymore because they are already on stage and for me to see this how how often, how clever Stephanie Cumming and Johnny Scoff deal with the things. This is a pleasure for me to watch it. So it changes a lot, and it changes like it changes even during a performance. It changes a lot. So you feed off from each other. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Has there been moments where you've said, "Okay, it's it's turning stale. We need to change. We need to do something." Yes, but there there are bad moments, but these are always like related to some technical problems and never to uh, quality of the performers for example or uh, things that they could have made better so I, li I really can recommend them both on stage to watch them and for me still after these years it's a pleasure to see them can you tell us Chris what we're going to be hearing what you hear is uh, lots of chaos. It's a medley of, of things that are happening on stage. And it's based on, um, you know, Vivaldi, the Vier Jahreszeiten, as the Four Seasons, the winter. But it's mixed with lots of uh, input from the dancers. It's mostly the end or the finishing track on stage. By Andreas Berger. Andreas Berger, yeah. All right, thank you very much. Chris Herring was with us from a Liquid Loft um, for Running Sushi. So ha I hope you have a great premiere in Montreal. And we hope to see you again. Have a good tour. Thank you very much. Sushi. 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 a German name? No. Burns. Burns Tons in August. <laughs> Is that how you want to start it? <laughs> yeah. So, Alison, tell us a bit about what you did during your vacation this uh, in at the end of August. Yeah, at the end of August, I had uh, the absolute joy and pleasure of spending a week in Berlin. And uh, 
going to Germany would be a waste if I didn't see some dance while I was there. I stumbled across this dance festival that takes place in August in Berlin. It's called Tanz im August. And uh, that translates to, of course, Dance in August. And uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, check out a couple shows uh, at the festival. Tell us a bit more about that. You told me that you had seen a few very interesting performances. Yeah, I mean, the first of which uh, I was kind of flying blind, but there was this uh, performance by Bruno Bellatro uh, from the company Grupo de Rua. And they were presenting a work called Cracks with a Z at the end and brackets Danza Morta. And uh, it seemed like a pretty safe bet. He's a Brazilian based uh, choreographer, and the show was like breakdance and hip hop inspired contemporary. And of course, you know, that is a common subject of discussion on this show. There's, there's some really exciting stuff happening in that realm. And uh, what struck me about it, I, again, I was going in pretty cold. I didn't have a um, recommendation from anyone. We just kind of came across the theater and, and wanted to see some dance. And part of the description that made me nervous was talking about how he empowered his performers to uh, create work based on YouTube videos and find inspiration in in what seemed to be pedestrian movement as well as dance movement. And then, of course, with this kind of hip-hop culture, uh, and, he, and he took that inspiration from them and to choreograph this piece. So I think when I read a description like that, there's a big fear that there's going to be no cohesion in the work, that it's going to be very kind of sporadic and crazy. And uh, it, it was not. It was very consistent. There was a really strong language and they, they were almost always kind of uh, horizontal. Not floor work necessarily, but a lot of like uh, spin kicks and uh, and slides and it was very, very cool, very moody, kind of uh, a lot of silhouette lighting. A big group and just one strong female presence on stage rocking it out. And I want to say too, almost as entertaining as it was to see the show itself was the crowd this show we saw i think on a tuesday or a wednesday evening at 9 p.m and this huge beautiful theater uh probably fit maybe 500 people and it was full people were lining up for tickets uh people showed up an hour before the performance to sit out on the steps and have a glass of wine and the enthusiasm for art in berlin was incredible we saw a couple other shows and same thing sold out crowds people happy to be there people who don't look like performers people who are all over the map the young people lining up for the last minute cheap tickets you got ladies the- in fur coats well, maybe not well, in August. It was but in August, yeah. But yeah, you got the the men in their in their suits who arrived by bike. Any monocles? No oh. monocles. No. Some glasses. I had my glasses on so I could see from our nosebleed tickets. But yeah, it was really exciting to see that enthusiasm. And then, what did you go see afterwards? The well, we we were only really planning on seeing one show, but after that experience, we had to see another one. And this one also blew my mind because it, it was put on at ten a.m on a Thursday, and uh, it was still full, (laughs) which was incredible. I mean, there was some, I think it was a school show, there were some school groups, but there was also, like, us standing around awkwardly amongst all the teenagers thinking, (laughs) what have we gotten ourselves into? And uh, there's a very clear reason for why there was a school show of this production. It was called Girls, and it's by uh, Hugo Dehes, uh, whose company is Fabulous. He originally created a piece called Women with seven women dancers, and it's an hour-long, kind of intense, everybody's on stage, um, lots of synchronization, lots of intricate movement, and lots of vocal work. There's no music. It's all grunts and giggles and and breathing and other things that you can do with, uh, with sound. And I didn't see that piece, though. What I saw was Girls, which was a remount of the work, but cast exclusively with 10 to 14-year-old girls, uh, which was really, really interesting. Um, the work itself was interesting. It was kind of a contemporary vocabulary. You, you see the femininity in the movement. You see the play in the movement. You see some, some more aggressive and upset movement. You see a lot of hysteria and, and other things like that. There's a lot to read into the movement. It's mostly standing. 
and it's mostly gestural. What was really incredible about this was the performances given by these 10 to 14 year old girls. Except for maybe a couple of the elder girls who were a little bit more stage ready, I think they were too full of information. They were too full of material to remember an hour of, of synchronized and and canon and, and otherwise intricate work. And obviously they had been instructed to keep their eyes opening on the audience. So they were connecting with us. And with, with all this going on, there wasn't a lot of space for performing with the... This with, idea of capital P performance? Exactly. Yeah. With the bunny ears around it. So it was really um, authentic, I felt like. Very, very open. And, uh, and yeah, and to see a 10-year-old girl, like just for a minute, look at that, on stage, just for an hour doing choreography. It was really incredible. And I'm very curious how women differs from girls as productions. And I would be very interested in watching that show. It's similar to what um, Pina did. With, uh, with the piece, I don't remember the name, but the one that was documented in Dancing Dreams, where you see this generational gap between people and you see how it's reflected in their movement, in their bodies, and all of that. It's, it's, these are really interesting questions to ask, but in piece like the one you're describing right now, where it's only those young girls that are on stage during the performance, there must be a dimension there that's really quite different too. Mm-hmm. And it should be said as well, there's a big difference between a 10-year-old and a 14-year-old, a visual difference and a maturity difference. And that's something you don't see in a company when you span between, you know, 20s and, and 30s. It, it, you kind of even out a bit more. Whereas, yeah, 10 to 14, you, you, there are different people in different stages of life on stage. And was there anything else that was part of that festival? Was there any workshops? Was there... Or was it just the shows? Uh, there was plenty, plenty of shows. There were also um, artist talkbacks. And this is cool. They, there is a ton of English in Germany, the little known secret. Uh, and there were even artist talkbacks in English being offered. And uh, it was all an international festival, a lot of international artists. So I can't say that I came back with any, uh, having seen any German dance, but definitely uh, was an incredible experience. And, uh, yeah. Great. Thanks for sharing your experience in Germany. Thanks for your curiosity. Dirty Feet is recorded every week at the Montreal Improv Theatre. Check them out at montrealimprov.com. Dirty Feet est produit et animé par... Produced and hosted by Alison Burns, J.D. Papillon, et Joanny Farrand. You can find out more about our show at nomoreradio.com, follow us on Twitter at Dirty Dirty Feet, and find us on Facebook at Dirty Feet Podcast. Vous pouvez écouter tous nos épisodes sur notre site web ou vous pouvez vous abonner également sur iTunes à notre podcast. Listen to past episodes on website or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. While you're there, be sure to give us a rating and or leave a comment to help us spread the word. Tune in next week for a whole new show.